Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, the Last Nighters, and the Last Nighters are part of the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Justice. It's from Season 1, Episode 7. This is a birthday request, special request by my co-host, Robert, and we have a special guest. He is Patrick McFarlane of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. We have been on his show several times. He's been on our show several times. We go way back, and uh, we're going to go boldly where... We've never gone before talking about Star Trek. And uh, Pat, how are you doing, sir? Uh, your website is liberty, libertyweekly.net. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back on your show. Always a good time. We always have fun. And I just celebrated the two-year anniversary of my podcast, the Liberty Weekly podcast. I launched on Memorial Day. Um, what is it? 2017 it was. So we've known each other about since then. And it's been quite the ride. But yes, I'm a real life lawyer. That's kind of the pull of my show. I'm admitted to practice in federal court and state court. This will be fun to tear apart here. Um, for all you, anyone watching the uh, the video portion of the show, here's a look see at my website. We have lots of great content coming up. Uh, this is some things that we've done recently. Uh, interview with Waco survivor David Thibodeau. Um, my appearance on Culture of Peace with Luke Tatum. We had Larkin Rose on the show. And I went over Libertarian Theory of Negligence. So lots of good stuff coming in your direction. I also appear on the Libertarian Institute, and that is Scott Horton's website, alongside um, the artist formerly known as Mance Raider and Kyle Anselone, who is a tour de force on the Libertarian Institute. But today we're going to be talking about Star Trek, The Next Generation. Pretty excited about this. There's a lot to pick apart in this episode that we've selected here um, so let's get at it. And there's a thunderstorm going on right now. So if you hear those scintillating sound effects and those dulcet tones, that's what that is. So I'm not banging the mic. <laughs> well, is the mic a euphemism? Okay. Well, it is phallic shaped. So man, Wait, we're just, we got that baby going. Phallic shaped. Yeah, we, we got that going. All right. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is episode 74 of the last nighters and you can find the show notes more at lastnighters.com slash 74. And if you want to help us out, uh, get some more earballs on this content. Do go ahead and uh, give us some some subscribes and some reviews and ratings on the old iTunes. And the more you do that, the higher the rankings we get and the more people will end up watching the show. So let's pick up. There is no Google description for this, but I do have some preliminary information to provide to kind of kick us off. And then I'll go to Robert with his opening salvo. This is just a general description. Picking up decades after Gene Roddenberry's original Star Trek series, The Next Generation follows the intergalactic adventures of Captain Jean-Luc Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, and his loyal crew aboard the all-new USS Enterprise NCC-1701D as they explore new worlds. Um, one of the key differences in the opening monologue that I noticed is that in the original, they say where no man has gone before, but in The Next Generation, in the 80s, I think 87 is the first uh, year of this, they say where no one has gone before. So even Almost uh, 30 years ago, we've already got the the uh, gender pronoun uh, action infiltrating the system, corrupting the system. All right. Right. Yeah. Star Trek has very always been fairly progressive. I mean, they were the first ones to have an on air kiss, inter interracial kiss between between uh, you know the Uhura. captain Uhura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kirk. So yeah, I, I think Roddenberry was pretty much. I don't know if he was, you know, an avowed socialist, but he definitely had some political ideas that he wanted to get across. Yeah, and they did have the uh, very variety uh, crew staffing, you know, like different races and different uh, countries of origin and things like that. And yeah, at the time, I think that was rather progressive. Um, it, it's in stark contrast to how they do it today, where now it's almost like they have a quota to fill. And no matter how many people they fit into their little quota system, there's always some quote-unquote marginalized group who's very upset that they were left out yes yeah I, you know this is all takes place of course before the internet really took off but i wonder if you know they had certain quotas to fit and we just didn't know about them like especially back with the original crew right so they had to have you know it's probably written in the script that okay this guy's got to be like a russian dude and this chick's got to be a black lady and blah 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 and so on and so forth but i don't know at the time it just seemed fairly innocent for me and my young little eyeballs it didn't really seem like a big deal. Not like uh, the left makes it out to be to these days that it's, you know, it has to happen and it must, and we must all have this, all believe the same thing. It's funny how the left has become the Borg. Yeah. Yeah. Diversity is our strength, but you must be assimilated. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
Uh, Pat, any comments on the uh, the opening here? I do have a description of the particular episode we're going to discuss, but I think that we've already kind of opened up a can of worms in regards to uh, just the overall concept of the original series and then the remake. Yeah, in some ways I'm totally unqualified to tackle a Star Trek episode because I do not watch Star Trek. And this was my first experience watching full episodes of The Next Generation, so I'm really outing myself here. But in terms of the Star Trek lexicon, it seems like The Next Generation is one of the best TV series iterations of Star Trek. Would that be accurate to say? Is it better than the original series? In my objective opinion, yes. It's, it's quite good. Okay. And I, was, I have seen the new movies that have come out, and I do like those. Those were pretty good. What do you guys think about those? Uh, those are pretty good for action-adventure type movies. I don't think that they really follow the spirit of what Star Trek has always been in the past. I think if they went more of a Star Warsy type thing, but uh, and they, did, all, they did the Star Warsy type thing better than the new Star Wars. Yeah. One could argue that fact. Yes. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed the, uh, the original reboot or the, you know, 2009, I want to say, but then um, they did into darkness, which was kind of all right. It had Benedict uh, Cumberbatch Cumberpatch as um, <laughs> Cumberpatch <laughs> Cumberpatch kid uh, as uh, what was the guy's name? Con, Con, the famous Con. But then we we did an episode on Star Trek Beyond a while back, and that one I did not like so much. Okay, I had a constitutional law professor whose name was Con, and I didn't I didn't watch too much Star Trek, but I would always shout Con. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, Andy taught Con law, so the the study of the convicts in Washington. Oh, so but um, but yeah. So I, yeah, I enjoyed these episodes. They kind of reminded me of, cause I'm, I really like Stargate SG one and they don't quite tackle. I mean, they kind of continue. They're a lot more campy, um, but they kind of continue in that vein and they have some philosophical quandaries and morality and ethics questions in it, but not quite to the degree that I saw in Star Trek here. But I did notice how a lot of these episodes, the plot was a lot similar to Stargate SG one episodes and kind of the plot tropes were kind of the same a bit too. But specifically, there are some Stargate SG-1, uh, one in particular that I'm thinking of that is very similar to the plot of this episode in some ways, at least in, in the theme, is that all these people on a planet, they're kind of Roman timesy in terms of technology, and they all just have sex all the time. So maybe we should dive into the episode itself. That's a good segue. Yeah, right. let's do that. Let's segue into that. We'll put the tractor beams on stun. I know that's a hodgepodge of how they say. I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's how that works. But okay. All right. So this is uh, season one, episode seven. It's called Justice, and the description is when Wesley is sentenced to death for innocently violating an alien planet's custom. Captain Picard is forced to choose between negotiating for Wesley's life or adhering to the Federation's prime directive, which prohibits interference with another civilization's way of life. So, Robert, take it away. Yeah, so we find the crew of the Star Trek surrounding this planet Rubicon 3. And Riker comes in and he's like, yo, we got to go down there. Dude, the people are super smoking hot. We got to get down there and have some fun. And Picard's like, really? Is that good? And he's like, oh, let me tell you. And so he's like, okay, yeah, go ahead, check it out. Oh, and Wesley, why don't you go down there too? Because, you know, reasons. And Wesley's like, yeah, that sounds great. So they all teleport down to this kind of like UC Berkeley campus or whatever. <laughs> and all these you know, like semi-nude young people are just like sprinting around for some reason. Like that's just kind of what they do in the air. And, and then they, of course, they run up to them and they greet them with like these nice soft embraces. And they're just like, hello. And so, obviously, if there's a future, this is the planet I want to live on. And screw you guys and your dumbass anarcho-capitalism. I didn't see a single person doing a single productive job this entire episode. They have no economy. It's clearly a communist socialist utopia. I want in. Give me my UBI. I'm getting it on with all the freak nasty hot people. See, I was going to say, it's, it's pretty much basically just a planet full of Joe Bidens. I mean... That's a <laughs> yeah. in opening sequence. Well, I not creepy that. old Joe. No, no, but but the same like actions, just in mm -hmm. different bodies. Right, right. No, well, well, exactly. I mean, if that's 
a smoking hottie that comes up and creeps on you, it's a bit of a different story, right? Uh, I suppose, perhaps. Well, I mean, tweet is on, but I'm just saying. <laughs> for us, for us monogamous fellows, yeah, I don't know. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been hit on by, I, I don't know, maybe a moderately attractive woman, and you're just not feeling it, and it's it's kind of awkward. She creeps up on you like Joe Biden. Mm, yes. But I would argue that that was not what was depicted in this episode. I mean, even if you didn't particularly find every one of these females super hot, the idea is that they're super hot and young and fit. And, you know, maybe they didn't have the budget to get all the top talent. (laughs) They were like a bunch of fours or fives. I don't know. But the idea of this kind of free love commie utopia, and it clearly works in the future. So sign me up. Fair enough. Yeah, so this this uh, society reminded me a lot of the discussion we had on the Liberty Weekly podcast last year on the Wild Wild Country Netflix series about the Bhagwan and the Rajneeshi. Um, what were they called? The the people were they the Rajneeshi? They lived in the in the mountaintop commune, and they had a very similar way of life to what was depicted in this episode that came out in 1987. Which I got to tell you, in watching this the other day. And how scantily clad these people were. I was I was aghast at how racy it seemed for that time. Yeah. There's like this massage scene right after like everybody's kissing on each other and just hanging out and I guess what, playing ball or dancing like aerobics, dance aerobics and uh, like just playing music. Totally so, checked out. Totally plausible. In real yeah. Life. This is like Karl Marx's utopia, right? He said he wanted to be like a musician one day and then like... A dance, a Roomba fitness instructor the next day? A Roomba. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But, okay, so the hallmark of this civilization is that there's no crime, we find, right? No crime. Though they did have crime in the past, and they attribute this lack of crime to their rule of law. So rather than having rulers per se, so they have like a near anarchistic system here where they have, uh, and, and Robert, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but how I believe it was described was they have zones where... The laws are enforced for a time, but nobody knows when and where. And so you're constantly potentially under threat of the law. So there's this constant pervasive sense that you might be under surveillance and that the consequences would be dire. And so it's sort of like a, um, what do they call that? Uh, like psychologically, like B.F. Skinner style, um, like training. It's like the panopticon. Yeah, it's like the Benthamite um, panopticon, but also like when you're like training a dog or you're trying to train a behavior, it's the reward or punishment pattern that gives you the most uh, rapid um, assimilation is to not have it be consistent every time, right? Because when the subject becomes to the point where they're expecting it every time, then uh, it's not as effective. So when it's like intermittent and sort of broken up, so they're they're never quite sure when they're going to get the reward or the punishment, that's when the behaviors stick. Right. It's it's the random enforcement, kind of like Stalinist, the Soviet Union, when it was the random enforcement of the laws, which was what made it more terrifying and more tyrannical, I suppose. Right. Because no one was really sure if they had done something wrong or not, or if someone actually had something that deserved it, or if they, they rationalized it afterwards, like, well, something bad happened to him, so he must have deserved it at some point. Right. One thing that struck me is that, okay, so there's no police in this society. Only mediators, which I thought was interesting because so the mediators will go around to the different zones and they will enforce the law, for lack of a better term. And I just thought it was interesting that they were called mediators because they're not really mediating anything. They're just going around and applying their judgment and executing the judgment in, in a very brief moment. Oh, you broke this law. Let's just declare you guilty and then we're going to stick you with this um this potion that kills you this poison and right a more accurate term would be like enforcers slash executors right or judge jury and executors instead they give them this kind of fancy nice sounding title of mediator which is completely wrong and yeah and something mediation would be something on both sides you're mediating some kind of a mutual resolution and there none of that is happening it's just death 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 which is this, Pretty is, metal. this is almost that Orwellian, you know, you call it something else to give it flowery language, but it really is, you know, something awful and terrible. So like taxation is theft, war is murder, you know, those types of things. You just call it something else and then all of a sudden it becomes permissible by 
the collective to to be able to do it. Yeah. And in in this one, yeah, so they are vesting all of this power and authority into single entities or a single group to be able to make these determinations on the spot, make the judgment on the spot, and do the execution on the spot. So it, it's a wonder that this system functioned at all for any period of time, and that it resulted in their society becoming this um, communist utopia. Right, and, and with random enforcement. And we have no idea how these mediators are selected, or do we? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I don't believe that was in the episode. I think... It, I, I, I don't think they got into that. I assume it'd be some sort of random lot and like one day you're having sex with somebody and the next day you're a mediator, but I don't know. And they must not get a lot of visitors because what eventually ends up happening, Robert? Mm. Well, before we get into that, um, oh, okay. I, I do have another comment and that is the Rothbard and he gets raked over the coals in present times related to this in his um, essay about unleashing the cops. And I don't know if anyone's was really prepared to get into the detail on this, but Anyone who's familiar with Rothbard and doesn't like him, this is usually one of the reasons why. And in my estimation, and I think Rollo McFlugel has a pretty good article explaining this, is that he's talking about police and policing services. When they're monopolized, of course, they're bad, uh, but they're still a necessary service in a society. And in a free market society, a laissez-faire society, they would still exist. And his solution to the criminal problem, especially in inner cities, was that the cops, the police, the policing service should be permitted to administer immediate deterrent or immediate punishment when somebody is definitely guilty of something. And this would act to reduce the amount of crime. Now, the, the caveat to this is that if they are wrong, they would be held personally liable for whatever transgression or aggression that they perpetrated against an innocent party. But I think that a lot of this nuance is lost. But in watching this episode, I was like, oh, that is very reminiscent of Rothbard's example of unleashing the cops. Wasn't he talking about like during a riot and everybody's smashing up Starbucks windows and destroying property and setting things on fire? Yeah, unleash the cops because they would actually be protecting private property at that point. Right. And it would be like an immediate response. Like you see somebody actively doing something. Right. So he was talking in a way that cops sometimes act. But not in the way they generally act, like so in a private property sense. Right. And then, Pat, you have a couple of episodes related to this, and, and you can throw out the uh, episode numbers in a moment. But you discussed where the cops actually no longer, through a um, court case, it's been determined that they don't, do not have a duty to protect. Yeah, that's correct. There's a few court cases that are cited for that, and it has to, I mean, there's, there's general nuance to it. But so there was Castle Rock v. Gonzalez. That was a Supreme Court case that came out of Colorado. And it was determining the holding of it was that there was no civil remedies for the non-enforcement of a restraining order under the color of the 14th Amendment, because the Supreme Court applies the Bill of Rights to the states through the window of the 14th Amendment through a series of it, there hasn't been one single court case. But over the decades, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Bill of Rights selectively will apply to the states. So in that specific Supreme Court case. There was a justice, I believe, Stevens, and I've said in previous episodes that it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I even wrote that in a paper in law school, but they didn't catch it. It was Justice Stevens and not Ruth Bader Ginsburg who said that if the, re if the respondent had contracted with a private security firm to obtain the services of um, a restraining order, surely she would be able to sue them through a contractual um, theory of law. Well, because the government undertakes to protect everyone, they should be treated no differently than any other person on the street in terms of having a duty to protect a specific individual. Uh, well, that's uh, that's um, that's D.C. What is that case? I'm, I'm just I'm blanking on it. It's D.C. The one that we cite all the time. DC. Warren. Warren v. District of Columbia. Yeah, thank you. And so I have episodes on that that I'll drop in the show notes page in just a second when I find it. Um but so very discouraging fact patterns. But in Warren v. D.C., this was a um, it was a D.C. Circuit case. So the D.C. Circuit, the federal D.C. Circuit is uh, it's like the baby Supreme Court. And a lot of the justices who go on in, to be appointed to the Supreme Court came from the D.C. Circuit. So it's the, the federal courts are broken up into district district level. There's two districts in Wisconsin. There's a D, uh, D.C. Circuit district court of court in D.C. specifically. And then it's the appellate courts. You'll hear like the Ninth Circuit, the cert, the um, all those different circuits. Those are the appellate courts. And then there's the Supreme Court at the top. So Warren v. D.C. is a 
federal district court. It's the D.C. Court of Appeals. Sorry, there's a D.C. District Court, there's a Court of Appeals, and then there's a Supreme Court. Sorry, I hope that this is straight. Hashtag boring. This is really interesting. This is why people want me to come on shows, right? So in to list court, about all the uh, the court structure in Washington, D.C. Yes, yes this is absolutely why you're very, here. It's very important which court ruled this way because it is not a Supreme Court opinion. And if it were a Supreme Court opinion, it would have more clout. But this is describing a general rule of tort liability, governmental immunity, that a bunch of women were getting raped in the top of this house. They called the police and the police showed up several times and didn't make any effort to rescue them. They ended up getting raped and held for six or eight hours and they were got the shit kicked out of them. And then they sued and um, the government was not held liable. So there you go. Sorry. <laughs> So basically what you're saying is there's a social contract for us, but not for the government. It's a one way thing. Pretty much. And I mean, we could get and there's really no technical. law. We could get technical and spend an entire hour episode on uh, explaining the nuance of tort law about this. Um, but basically, yes, my position is that it from a legal standpoint, it makes sense not to hold the police liable because it just would not make the police just would not work because they'd be getting sued all the time and then they'd be paying out judgments all over the place. Anyone who was mugged or anything at any time would have standing to sue and they would and they would be paid out through taxpayer dollars. So just get rid of the police. Then you don't have that problem. Well, I could see it being, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that anybody would, a reasonable person would find anybody, a property owner or otherwise responsible for any kind of attack that would happen to just happen to take place on their property. But if there's a repeated consistent, you know, thing that is a result of their negligence or their failure to act when confronted with, you know, obvious evidence, then I would see that would be more reasonable to hold them liable for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I suppose that's what I mean. It wouldn't just be every job, you know, everybody who was mugged at any time, but at any point where someone had called the police and they took 15 minutes or 20 minutes to show up, um, I guess you would have to judge it based on, you know, the negligence. But the the specific case law, like Warren v. D.C., it's the non-action of the police officer. They cannot be held liable for that. But when they overtake a positive action and they do it negligently, that's when we're going to hold them liable. So their incentive is to never do anything. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah, How is that a workable it, system, Patrick? Oh, it's not. I'm saying that it wouldn't be workable, you know, to hold them liable for not acting when they should have acted because then they'd be sued all the time and they'd have to pay out with taxpayer dollars. And they'd be sued out of existence and maybe we could actually get rid of them? Maybe, yeah. But um, so from, from a logistical standpoint, if you're going to buy into the legal state paradigm, the judgment makes a lot of sense. But does that mean it's just or right? No. And that's libertyweekly.net forward slash 46 for you. So it seems like this is a pragmatic decision then. Oh, yeah, it's a pragmatic okay. decision. But it also makes sense from the standpoint of tort law, too. And I explained that in 46. So we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But that's just a taste for you. All right, okay. I have a quick sidebar for you, Pat. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that people have cited Warren v. District of Columbia in regards to gun rights and the ability to have a firearm to defend yourself, is that correct? And is it related to this judgment in that if the police aren't liable to protect you, even after you've called them, then therefore you should be able to be armed to defend yourself? Well, it has nothing to do with gun rights. That's Heller. The... Oh, yes, that is correct. Okay, sorry. Right. No, no, but, but you're right in that people will cite this case and say you should be strapped because the police have no duty to protect you. And I guess my point with going through all the different levels of courts in the United States is saying that, yeah, it really makes a difference which court this opinion came from. Because if you're going to cite this as some kind of a blanket statement about the rule throughout the whole United States, you would be technically in some ways incorrect. However, in the opinion that itself, and I go through it in that episode, I believe Liberty Weekly on that forward slash 46. It's my most viewed video on YouTube, 2.5 thousand. Holla. But yes, so you should be strapped because there's no duty to protect. But in the opinion itself, they say that they are describing a very broad ranging general rule of tort law. So check that out. And the other one, uh, Gonzalez v. Castle Rock, I talked about in 
a recent episode of the podcast, but also libertyweekly.net forward slash 55, where I talked about my domestic violence paper. And that is downloadable if you sign up for my email list at libertyweekly.net forward slash email. All right, shilling your all your wares. All right. Thank yeah, you usually that happens at the end of the show. <laughs> all right, well, let's get back to uh, the next generation here for a moment. So, Robert, you were about to go into what happens, what, what causes kind of the conundrum within the episode. So take it away. Okay, so the, the adults want to go off and do their thing with other adults. And they kind of pawn Wesley off on some other kids that are just happen to be running by because everybody's running by. And so Wesley is playing with these kids. And by playing, I mean, they just kind of like jog around. And they get a ball. And they go like, Wesley, do you know any games with balls? And he's like, yeah, but we need to get a stick. And they're like, we don't know what the fuck a stick is. Speak English, motherfucker. And he's like, um, you know, like a long, like wood, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, well, we could get one of those in the garden. And they're like, okay, let's go get that. And so they're running along and they're throwing the ball back and forth. And then just as they get to the garden, the one guy throws the long bomb and Wesley goes and runs for it and he lays out and he jumps and leaps. And they're like, no, Wesley, no. And he jumps and he leaves. And he falls into this flower bed that is just beyond this, I don't know, like knee high, maybe ankle high little fence thing, white little fence thing. And he just easily jumps over that. No problem. I mean, just you could just step over it. It's, it's not an, Im- an impediment in any way. And he falls in and he crashes and he's like, oh, I'm fine. He dusts himself off. He's like, whatever. I'm fine. No worries about it. And they're all just like, oh, my God. And then instantly these two guys come running over and they're like, did you do this? And he's like, yeah, don't worry. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. And they're like, oh, man, I threw the ball. And so the mediators determined that Wesley had fallen in and he totally admits it. And then, of course, perfect timing. The other Star Trek crew member adult guys come over. And they had just learned about this death penalty for all offenses deal that the Edo have. And so they arrive and the, um, the mediators are like, OK, he admits it. And they pull out this little stabby vial syringe thing and they're about to go stab him with it. And Worf's like, no, nah, I don't think so, son. <laughs> and he pulls out his face and he's like, drop it, motherfucker. And they're like, what are you doing? I thought you became you were our friends. What? Don't do this. This is our law. You got to respect our law. And they're like, yeah, no. And so then there's the big conflict at the center of this episode. Should the Star Trek with their prime directive not interfere with the the rules and the laws and the lives of these people that they interact with? Or do they save Wesley's life for this bullshit offense? Because, I mean, they didn't even tell him about any kind of potential thing. It's clearly not a life and death situation. Um, Who even owns that little garden? Does, is it community property? Could he, you know, re- offer recompense to the actual? Could he just rebuild it? No, they have this super strict one and done rule that you do anything, and if it just so happens to be in this little area that they happen to be, you know, watching at that moment, then you're a dead person, and that's what happens to Wesley. So, what do you guys think? Is it, they they claim that it's the reason why they have no crime? Is is the death penalty a deterrent to crime? Has it been in the past? These are things, these are questions I think we should probably answer. Well, I think it's interesting that there is no crime because in of itself, what Wesley does is not a crime. And this is really wrapped up in the question of deterrence too, because, you know, in crim law, in law school, they teach you about the different methods. They teach you about all the different elements of different crimes, common law crimes. They also teach you about the different theories of punishment. And deterrence is one of them, you know, but but you got to you got to think about, well, what behavior are you trying to deter? And that's just the thing is that a basic core concept of what constitutes a criminal offense is the actus reus, which is the criminal act and the mens rea, which is the criminal mind. And in this, Wesley has no mens rea. There's no intent to commit a crime. And that's that's, you know, one of the two cornerstones of what constitutes a crime. So the whole goal of deterrence is just bs here at least in this application and i don't believe deter- deterrence works very well as a theory of punishment and i think that the legal field has kind of the scholars in the legal field have kind of come to this conclusion and have compared to other nordic countries which is funny 
Um, but yeah, there's no crime here. So what are you deterring exactly? You're deterring the mens rea? Well, don't act negligently. Maybe it's a civil offense. I would think it's not a civil offense because um, I don't think Wesley was acting negligently. He was acting like any reasonable child would act, perhaps. What do you guys think? I'd argue he was being negligent, and they do offer to pay for the damage. And I think that's totally fine. I, I think that they should accept that, yes, they caused the damage and they should pay for the damage, and that should have resolved it. But this is clearly an accident, right? I mean, any reasonable person would go, oh, well, you didn't mean to do this. Like, like Patrick said, there's no mens rea. So right. what do we do in cases of an accident? Well, there's you, insurance? Yeah, you'd have to determine, though, whether or not he was being negligent. I guess that's a question for a jury. I particularly don't think he was being negligent. I think it's reasonable for a teenager to be throwing balls around and not pay attention to where they're going and do something like this. Well, and the other guy overthrew him. So it's and he even tried to, very him, tried to say that it, it was his fault that Wesley fell into the little flower bed thing. Right. But this Robert is right to take the insurance route. I mean, in a real life situation like this, this would be insurance would probably, you know, pay up the premium or, um, you know, how much is the damage really property and property damages like that are usually solved very easily, like in a car accident. That's all handled between insurance companies. Right. This does Most seem part. rather minor. In, in the scheme of things. And yeah, you're right. I mean, when you're talking about the deterrence theory and not being very effective, um, did you guys talk about or learn about um, Bentham's position on this? Like he was a big, he was big on deterrence. You know, he was like, the more likely the crime, the more severe the punishment should be to reduce the likelihood of the crime. Um, but then that would mean that anyone who steals an apple should be punished with the death penalty. Whereas somebody who commits murder, because it happens so rarely in a relative sense to stealing an apple, uh, should get off rather lightly. And so that doesn't seem to be a very effective or coherent method of uh, administering punishment or justice. Yeah, the, in, in law school, there's uh, surprisingly little discussion of actual philosophy behind this. Very little. Maybe we spent, I don't know, 10 minutes in one lecture on the the actual scholars who have written about the theory of punishment and all those things. Um, Anarchist Mom says that he was negligent. So what what do you think, Daniel? And and chronic, why don't you weigh in too? And the, we have the chat going here for our Patreon subscribers. Yeah, you can join us on Patreon at lastnarrative.com slash Patreon and watch these live streams. And then uh, Pat, throw out your Patreon and, and we'll make sure that you have the ability to share it with your audience as well for future episodes. Yeah, my audience and my Discord members, libertyweekly.net forward slash Discord and Patreon subscribers get access to any live streams that I do. Um, so join that patreon.com forward slash Liberty weekly. Um, it seems though that I don't know the consensus is, is that, but let me give you a jury instruction because this would be agreed upon before the trial is that any, t how old is Wesley? Is he he's like, he's a minor. He's, yeah, he's like 14, 15. So I would argue for a reasonable, a reasonably prudent 16 year old boy standard would a reasonably prudent 16 year old boy try and catch a ball and, you know, not not pay attention to where he's going is that reasonable behavior for a 16 year old well and what what obligations does wesley have okay so put yourself in his shoes in order for this to be negligence wesley has to be you know aware of the rules and the laws of this plant that he's going to right because otherwise he can only be negligent of the laws if he's aware of the laws even though they say you know negligence you know ignorance of the law is no excuse but Okay, so does he have an obligation to understand all the rules and laws of every society he goes into before he goes into that society? Because I would argue that it's completely unreasonable because we don't even know the laws of this freaking country. It's, we have lawyers and judges that are in, try to interpret the stupid-ass code thousands and tens of thousands of pages of bullshit laws in this country, let alone traveling to another country and knowing every single stupid law that they follow or are supposed to follow. So how do you expect Wesley to know every dumb little law that they have? I, I can't see, I can't see negligence here. I think he thinks he's acting like a, a kid would act and you can't describe harm to his actions. And you definitely can't, I, I would call it an accident and leave it to insurance is what I would do. But all yeah. right. So let me interject here, Robert, because you are, you are, I'm off the handle. You're off, flying up the chain. You are I'm off the reservation. You're off the reservation. Like Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Perfect. So in previous episodes, we've talked about your prowess with a wiffle ball bat. So in I your, him like this. In your run-ins with the law. Many there have been, yes. <laughs> with your 
menacing behavior with imposing and amazing physical attributes. Yes. Where you are hitting wiffle balls into the neighborhood. Right. If we just swap out the wiffle ball for a standard baseball and, and someone yeah. is playing baseball and they hit like in the sandlot, they hit the ball over the fence and into someone's window and break the window. Are those yeah. children not responsible for having broken that window? And by extension, the parents would probably be uh, in a position where they would need to replace said window. I would think that they would be in. Yeah, absolutely. They'd be responsible. They, they're the ones that did it. But is the question is, are they then guilty of something that needs punishment in other beyond that? Only like, if only if the mens rea component is there. We're like, hey, I bet you two bits that you can't break that window over there with this baseball. And they're like, oh, yeah, watch me. Watch me, buddy. I can do <laughs> Call your this. shot and and just crack it over the fence there. Then, right. So. Then, yes. Right. I mean, and, and the Edo guy claims that laws create tranquility, right? And I would argue that laws are one form of consequences, right? And I would say the consequences help to create tranquility because it's usually in times where you don't think you're going to get caught, that you're far more likely to steal something or commit a crime or whatever. But when a whole bunch of eyeballs are on you, when you are afraid of some kind of consequences, you're far less likely to commit a crime. Let's take it a step further, Robert, just to sign you here. Mm -hmm. But then if you incentivize or subsidize said behavior by rewarding it, then you get more of this type of behavior. By what? What are we, what are we using to incentivize this behavior? I, I just mean in, in a general sense. So not only is... Um, so the friend that incentivizes it says, hey, I bet you can't hit it in that window? No, I'm, I'm going more in the uh, the unwed mother getting big daddy government to replace the man in the family so by subsidizing that behavior you get more of that behavior i'm just taking your initial kernel of an idea and taking it further making it into a whole big old bowl of popcorn yeah big old bowl of popcorn but more into a positive like like additional thing you know i'm not quite following what you're saying pat do you know what daniel's talking about no not really (laughs) All right. Well, Robert, you and you and I can can discuss for a minute. Pat needs to uh, take a, a moment here. Yeah, I'll be Does right he? back. You guys riff off of that. But OK, OK, Pat, what I was going to interject and maybe be a little more esoteric, though, is that, um, again, even the, the theory and the idea of negligence and the theory of the dichotomy between criminal law and civil law doesn't even exist on this planet. Right. I mean, this is a totally foreign system. Yeah, right. they're, they're uh, cave people. They're very yeah. primitive in in regards to their conception of law. They worship a spaceship, but they're very so, yeah. married. They're very married to the the uh, conception that they have, you know. And they're not really willing to adapt it because they think that it's worked very very well. Now it hasn't worked very well for all the dead people who are no longer on the planet as a result of some minor infraction that was exactly randomly yeah, th- sized upon them. Right. Yeah. That was another issue that bring this brings up is that they, of course they lack proportionality and it prevents the perpetrator from redeeming themselves right there's no chance for them to do community service to learn from their mistakes all they can do is be a warning to others right and there's no restitution to the aggrieved party that right. property is not going to get uh, fixed or paid for there's no compensation made if you inject wesley with this uh overdose right yeah they didn't they they were far more interested in killing wesley than in repairing the damage done, which which seems odd. Right. So it, it almost makes the crime itself inconsequential. It's like they don't care about the crime per se, like the actual infraction or, or the damage that was caused. They care more about adhering to the ritual that they have. Yes. And reinforcing this threat among the population that, yeah, you can be killed at any time for any reason, basically. Even though they say, well, you know, all the... It seems it really it seems really strange and unworkable, right? I mean, it, it worked for this one situation, but I can't imagine too many situations. If if all the if all the no go zones are in you know behind these white fences, it, it's I feel like that there would be other crimes, you know? Well, they did say that their society was full of crime prior to their implementation of whatever system this is, and right. And- but if, if if the only crime could possibly be trespassing. Over this white fence area, like rape is still okay in this society. 
murder is still okay as long as it's not done behind a white fence? Well, I, you can't rape the willing, Robert. And I believe every person that was, every Edo who was shown in this episode was very willing. Which is why it's the greatest place in the universe. That's why Riker wanted to go back like you, like you said. Yeah, Riker knows what's up. He wants to get his dick wet. You know. So when, when we uh, first brought up this episode and discussing it, I hearkened back in my memory banks, my, my repository of childhood experiences. And I thought that perhaps this episode of Star Trek The Next Generation was in response to an international incident that had occurred Ooh. in Singapore by a kid named Michael Fay, who, and in my recollection, it was he had spit gum out on a sidewalk, and that was a no-no crime in their society. And he was caned as a result. And the United States uh, was involved. The government of the United States was involved because he was an American citizen. They're like, well, you can't cane an American citizen. Now, it turns out in researching for this episode that it was not him spitting out gum. It was him vandalizing cars uh, while Mm. in Singapore. So it's a little bit different than my recollection from 25 plus years ago. But beyond that, uh, this episode of Justice, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, came out in November of 1987. And the uh, Michael Fay caning uh, incident was, I believe, in 1993. So it is in no way a response to the Michael uh, Fay thing. But it may be in response to some other thing that happened in the world, because that's it's a very similar situation where a kid is in a foreign culture, does something that you would normally be dealt with a certain way in one society and it's dealt with a completely barbaric, you know, way in another society. And that's, and that gets into the argument of cultural relativism. Um, and the way that the Edo say, well, you can't judge us. And Picard's like, yeah, I can <laughs> totally can. And as a libertarian, you know, I can definitely say that, you know, I, I judge people all the time. I judge cultures all the time. I judge, I judge it by my own, my own lens, you know, what, wh- who's the aggressor? What, whose property rights are violated? What, what is a, a reasonable response to this transgression? Right. And you're ascribing to an objective morality that exists. Like certain things are wrong, no matter who does them. Right. But the Edo are like, Oh, look at you, you and your advanced, super advanced uh, technological people and us and our backward ways. Why don't you just use your might makes right and steal Wesley back and, screw us because we're just a bunch of dumb backward barbarians and they're saying that you can't judge us because you know just because you have a different sense of justice and picard's like "Mm, yeah i can (laughs) and i'm totally like yeah i can't and i want you know when when picard eventually at the end is just like yeah we're just going to take wesley back because i have a greater responsibility to my crew and the lives of my crew than to your dumb laws or the prime directive. Or the prime directive for that matter, right? Because he says that the prime directive never intended for kids to be killed. I don't know about that. Yeah, the, at other times in this show, they talk about the prime directive being, you know, that the, that the, the Federation isn't one to, you know, throw away its laws when it's uncomfortable. But I think Picard is absolutely correct in the situation. I, I would every day, all day, every day be like, yeah, I'm not letting you kill my, my crew member because he... Stepped on some flowers. That's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. And, and I think this is a case of um, you're willing to commit a smaller violation to prevent a greater harm. And right. that, yeah, you're guilty of violating that minor thing or that smaller, lesser thing. And you're, you're, you're basically going to be subjected to whatever consequence results from that. But you're taking it upon yourself to do that, knowing those consequences because of the outcome that you want to achieve. Exactly. Yeah. I think the example I gave an episode or two ago was, would you be willing to trespass on somebody's property to save your daughter's life? And you're like, yeah, of course I would. It's a no brainer. And I'll deal with the consequences of trespassing. But <laughs> because come what may, I'm saving my daughter's life. I don't give a shit. That's just the, the way the things are going to be. And if you could completely explain it to the people, you know, but the Edo, the Edo are like, I ain't having it. They can't it, it, see this at all. They get all butthurt about it. Yeah. They're like, yeah, so what? Yeah, it sucks when people die, but, you know, people got to die for our wonderful system. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 all, I, all I can do is look on in horror. Now, we haven't even brought in their god because that was, 
I think in the plot, it was a way to kind of hold Picard a little bit more accountable to the prime directive because they had to satisfy their God to be allowed to leave. Like they even attempt to transport away with Wesley and it like doesn't work because this uh, half dimensional or two dimensional, like they're in half in one dimension, half in another. They somehow have the ability to disrupt the communications and the ability for the transporter to uh, move them off the planet. And right. So Picard needs to make an appeal to them and their sensibilities, uh, which are more along the lines of understanding the logic and the morality in play versus the Edo, who are rather primitive in their understanding of these things. Right. And the God thing, which is like some sort of spaceship that is temporal or translucent or whatever, claims ownership over the entire what they call a star cluster. And at one point, Data says there are 3,004 other colonizable planets in this cluster. So that means that there must be, you know, tens of millions of stars and it's just this enormous place. And this one starship god creature or collective or ship that has multiple people in it or whatever claims ownership over all of it. And I was wondering if you had an issue with that. It sure seems like because the starship crew just accept it and they're just like, OK, we're, we're sorry, we're going to appease you and we're going to take our colonists back that we put down on this other planet in this cluster. but. I wonder if you would do the same thing or whatever. Like you come across this ship that claims ownership over an area of space that is fucking enormous. <laughs> and I, my first question would be like, really? <laughs> what did you do? How do you, you really, you own all these tens of thousands of starships and star, I mean, star systems and whatnot. Yeah. You know, I thought that that was um, in the, in the, how do I say this? I think that the scale can be disregarded. Because the, okay. the scale is is a matter of perspective, you know, it's relative, and it's sort of like you know somebody could own a farm. Well, their farm just happens to be you know tens of thousands of planets in a sector because they are interdimensional beings. You know, they can be in all places at all times at you know at once, right? They, they have these godlike uh, attributes as described in the episode, and they are overseeing these people, these Edo and other civilizations on these other three thousand planets per chance, and perhaps they view them as like their livestock in a way. Right. Well, they, I think at one point they talk about them as being like a child race to them. Like they created them and they're kind of shepherding them and watching them as they grow and evolve and whatever. Um, yeah, I kind of give if, a if on that. Yeah. If it's, if it's true that, and I'd still be skeptical, but if it's true that they do watch over all these planets and they intervene and they protect and defend all these planets, I would give them somewhat deference to claiming ownership over it, although I'd be skeptical that they actually understand ownership in the sense that we understand ownership of property. Right. That, do, they, do they necessarily like, have to have ownership to be able to tell an outsider, an intruder, to say, you know, to say to them, hey, we're we're in a protective capacity over this planet and this entire cluster, and you need to... That, yeah, that's, no, that's perfectly fine. Like, these people are under our protection... And you need to bugger off or be really play nicely with these people because we will fuck you up if you don't. I have no problem with that. That is somebody coming to the defense of another. No problem. But if they're claiming ownership over the Edo as if they're their property, which they didn't really seem to act that way, although they are, they know that these people worship them as gods, which they were like, eh, whatever. Whereas Picard was like, no, no, we're not gods. No, that's you know we're just the sufficiently advanced beings um if if they actually thought that they were treat them as if they're property then of course yeah i've got issues because the edo are conscious you know they are sentient like we might get into in the next episode we do and you can't own somebody like you would own a toaster i think we've uh, established that in human history yeah it took a while but yeah i think i think we're all on the same page now at least the three of us on this conversation it's funny you brought up the God situation because that's a lot like Stargate where they go around and everyone thinks they're gods and everything. I wonder if they got it from this. Probably not. When did the original Stargate come out? Like 90 something? The film with Kurt Russell and James Spader? Yes, yeah, something like that. I was early 90s, I want to say. I wanted to make a few comments about the whole, like the moral quandary between the prime directive situation because I think I might disagree with you guys on that and maybe we can tease it out a little bit. Sweet. I, I would not interfere. Um, if you I let would, Wesley die, if I was Picard, I would interfere. But in a realistic situation, I don't think I would interfere. And wait a minute, 
you just got done saying mm -hmm. that Wesley wasn't negligent, that this would be dealt with with insurance. Yeah, it's totally He's just being up. a normal kid. And now you're going to let him die. Yeah, yeah, it's totally. What? <laughs> All right. Let me hear it. So, um, all right, Pat, I'm no longer calling you with my one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely well, not. I'm not a criminal defense attorney anymore. So um, I'm a civil rights attorney. There's a difference. But among other things, I am. But so you're you're coming to the headbutting of two libertarian principles here. One is Ron Paulian non-interventionism. On the one hand, that's the prime directive. And on the other hand, you have this uh, Thomas Jefferson said, we have a moral duty to break unjust laws, right? And so I would agree that this law is objectively unjust because we have the non-aggression principle, which is somewhat of a um, morality, I believe, is both objective and subjective. But the NAP is our objective version of morality in some sense. It's a legal code in a different way as well. But we have these two conflicting ideas. I think that if this were a real situation, it would be more complicated than let's just swoop in and pick up Wesley and save him from this fate. There's more that is stopping you from just swooping in and violate. There's more than just the prime directive stopping you from swooping in and violating. The prime directive exists because in reality, we cannot swoop in on our libertarian chariot and just absolve the situation like that. If this were a real situation, uh, with our technology, we couldn't just beam Wesley up and then fly away and be done with it. We would have to go in and fucking slaughter everyone that stood in our path that tried to keep us from springing Wesley out. And I think that's the reality of the situation. Like, um, But we'd be justified in doing so. I don't think so. I don't but think you would. Someone who is unjustly charged with a crime with the punishment being death. So it would be a self-defense situation and defense of another. You, you... Hmm, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't know. I don't think, morally speaking, I don't think it would be right to go in and kill five security guards who are... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Patrick, yeah. do you know what, what can of worms you are opening, sir? Well, you're are you saying Are you saying that Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, <laughs> when they killed all those stormtroopers to rescue Princess Leia, they were committing atrocities? I don't know. I didn't think of it this way, I suppose. But you are going in up and you're disrupting an entire society in the same like way that down there is violation of the prime directive. Just being down there, just interacting yes. with a civilization is an intervention. Well, it, we're talking, I suppose we're kind of talking about the microcosm and the macrocosm. But in a sense, I'm talking about the macrocosm in which, yes, Assad is a terrible, terrible dictator. Um, but no, we shouldn't go in there and blow everything up and destroy Syria. <sighs> Well, I think you can't these be a are... empire and just go around trying to fix societies that we don't agree with. According but that's to... not what Picard was doing, was he? No, he wasn't trying to fix their society. He was like, I'm not going to let you murder my kid. Right. But I'm saying as a consequence, if if we do not have the beam up technology, then by necessity, from a consequentialist standpoint, you would have to go in guns blazing to take him out unless you could mediate the situation, which, of course, I would do that firstly. Um, but if they if you come to some kind of a stopping point, it's either you're going to go in and kill a whole bunch of people and disrupt a society or you're going to take your lickings. I don't know. OK, but wait, that's, wait, that's, wait, wait. That's why they had the plot device of the God preventing them from communicating with the Enterprise and transporting. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Of course, the situation into the, into the plot. But at the okay, end, but wait. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, wait. Let me just. I understand, of course, war is a greater atrocity, of course. But there's also these things that happen in this real world called prisoner rescue missions. Limited, where they, like no boots on the ground. No, it's boots on the ground. They get like a SEAL Team 6 or whatever. Kinetic action. And they go in and they kill a bunch of guards. And they extract, you know, U.S. citizens or whatever, and then they bugger off. Is, are you saying that that? What if that starts a war? I, I, of course, we're talking about states and everything's messy and wrong and bullshit. Yeah. But I would want if if okay. So let's say your 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 baby gets kidnapped tomorrow by somebody. Are you telling me that you're not going to go and rescue that kid because you're afraid that of the consequences that would happen? Yeah, but I mean, this the immediate situation is a little bit different than just a plane out of the plain blue sky. Someone comes and steals your child. I mean, it, it is morally wrong. Yes, but um, but it's it's a little more justifiable a little bit. Not a lot. 
Well, anytime you're getting into these type of politics, yeah, it gets messy and well, horrific, be, I think it's different because Wesley goes into a different society and interacts with it, whereas opposed to, you know, someone coming and taking my baby from my house or something, you know. Don't you think it's strange, though, that they're going to treat this off-worlder with the same laws that they would treat yeah, natives? Yeah, strange, yeah. Like, with no deference to the fact that this person is from a completely different planet. I mean, yeah, yeah they don't have any system of adjudication or judgment that is, um, has any nuance to it at all. Yeah. Context, nuance, you know, past, past offenses. None of that's taken into account. Yeah. This is a very primitive, primitive society that has a, a, a religious level of adherence to their, to their. See, I, I, th- I think this is the difference too, in, in some way that yes, the, so these guards, they don't know they're doing wrong. They're just enforcing the culture that they've known their entire life. And I don't think that absolves them of moral guilt, but I, I think it makes it maybe a little worse when you go in guns blazing and just kill all of them. Oh, so when Worf point. sta- points his phaser at them, you were like, Worf is violating the NAP right here. Uh, I don't know. It's tough. Yeah. I wouldn't want to make that call. What do you think, Daniel? Because I was totally on board with Worf at that moment. I was like, yep, <laughs> that's what I would do. Yeah, I was on board with Worf and Picard and and the whole resolution to the entire episode, which we should start resolving the episode on our own. But are you saying we're already up against time, which is this one episode? Yeah, and we were ambitious, or I was <laughs> potentially do two or even three episodes, but obviously that is not going to happen tonight tonight. So I'm glad that we stuck to just the one. But it was interesting, um, Patrick, and, and this will probably be another can of worms. But you mentioned that the guards, even though they were raised in this culture and they believe what they were doing was right and they saw no moral problem with it, there is an ob- objective morality. He was, they were unjustly going to execute Wesley Crusher. And so are you saying that because they had ignorance of objective morality in this case, <laughs> or they were blinded to it, then they are not subjected to it and therefore defending Wesley's life against them and their aggressions against him would be wrong? Because I... I don't think it would be wrong just because they don't happen to see past the uh, clouded thinking they have uh, in regards to the the crime they're about to commit. Like the the fact that they don't see it as a crime and they're just doing their job uh, Mm -hmm. doesn't absolve them of perpetrating it. Yeah. I don't know. I guess if like, if you could guarantee a limited strike and you would only kill prison or security guards, I mean, are you going to kill five people to prevent the unjust death of one person? I would if those people are aggressing against that one person. Yeah. If they're adults and they are unjustly, you know, forcing him to be in this cage or whatever. Yeah. And I wouldn't feel bad about it at all. I mean, I'd be sad that those people died, but I wouldn't feel like I had done anything wrong. Now, they also don't have a component of mens rea, right? Because they don't believe they're they're committing anything untoward. Right. I, I was thinking that earlier and Cody just mentioned that in the chat too. But I mean that doesn't that doesn't absolve police officers of, you know, their moral blameworthiness for enforcing victimless crimes. Right. Even though they don't necessarily have the mens rea. I mean, they have the mens rea to commit the act itself. So I guess it'd be a differentiation between you just have to have the intent to commit the act itself, whether that's criminal, you know the criminal act you have to have the intent to commit the criminal act whether or not you know the act is wrong is a different question so you just have to have the state of mind where you willfully committed the act if i'm remembering yeah aren't there isn't there a distinction for that yeah with with murder right that would be you know second degree murder would be killing without you know malice of forethought um manslaughter would be killing someone without the intent to kill them i believe and then first degree yeah first degree would be yeah premeditated malice of forethought intentional and And intentional manslaughter man i really need to they tested this they tested the hell out of this on the bar exam and i was like when the fuck like how many of us are going to try a murder case or defend a murder case like maybe one percent of all attorneys that take the bar in any given year but it's a whole freaking section dude you could get my cousin vinnied any moment i could be giving you a phone call yeah not anymore Um, well, now I know better. <laughs> well, I, I guess um, I am, you know, I'm a member of the bar, so I can take pretty much any case. But my firm just is not equipped to handle criminal law cases. Not All right, boys, let's wrap this one yeah. up. I'd love to tease this apart for another hour. This whole thing with the 
you know, are you going to kill five prison guards to save one prisoner? Tell you what, let's do that in our Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is Patreon bonus content. And that can be available at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. We'll tease this out even further. But for now, let's get into some final summaries and reviews. Cool. Okay. Well, I'll go first. So obviously this is the episode I wanted to do and I thought it turned out great. Thanks, Pat and Dan for chipping in and doing your part and making this a fantastic episode about this Star Trek episode that I, you know, thought it was going to be good. And then I watched it and then I was like, fuck yeah, we got to do this. This is going to be great because this hits all the kind of fun things that libertarians love to talk to in our nerdy brains. You know, I, I think cultural relativism is a dumb, dumb idea. I think some cultures just are better and we can judge others on their actions, regardless, like we were just talking about, regardless of whether or not they know they're doing something horrifically immoral or not. Um, what was, you know, ultimately with Wesley's crime, there needs to be somebody with standing to claim that they were harmed in order to, you know, prosecute this crime, right? There needs to be, you know, an aggrieved party. And in this case, who is the aggrieved party? The flowers, the owner, property owner of the flowers were never given that person. So we got to assume that this is some sort of public property. And I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> that just cannot be a just system where you where you're going to execute somebody for trampling on some publicly owned property. Uh, I understand their argument that, you know, laws affect, you know, this create this great utopia. And that is what, you know, status would love to have us believe that without the laws, we'd all just be running around murdering and killing and destroying everything all the time because human beings just love to do that. Well, some do, but rarely do they do it when there's consequences and consequences can be anything from a law to a dirty look that your friend gives you or a disapproving look that somebody gives you or, you know, a news story that happens about you or any kind of public shaming, uh, especially in this world today with all kinds of public shaming going on all over the place, especially online and people being deathly afraid of being publicly shamed. Human beings are super averse to that. So the idea that laws are what makes a peaceful society, I would argue that public pressure and social norms are what create a more well-behaved society. That and, you know, the right to defend yourself and property rights and, you know, having a weapon and being armed and that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, this is a fun episode to do. I want to thank everybody for doing it. Thank everybody for listening. Um, if I was going to give it a number, I mean, it was a good episode to watch. I mean, finally acted and whatever. But just for the content, I got to give it like an eight. Fantastic. Who's next? Yeah, I would I would cast a little bit of shade on the the effectiveness of deterrence, but I don't have all I didn't study deterrence in prep for this episode. I think the episode in itself in terms of spurring conversation is excellent. Um there's a lot to pick apart here and if if Star Trek's greatest asset it's is its ability to foment discussion like this, then I think that's fantastic. Although I you know much less a lot of much like a lot of the uh, ethical quandaries that commies would throw our way, I think that this is not a very plausible situation. Um, this society would not function in real life. This beaming up mechanism is a convenient solution to this ethical quandary that they've developed. So I don't know. In terms of that, I would I would uh, cast a little shade on that. But it's it's certainly um, a good dilemma to discuss. So I guess I would give it. No, 7.5 maybe with for adjusted for plot holes. Oh, and I wanted to say one thing too. When the, when the commies throw these ethical quandaries our way, the unrealistic nature of them, I think cheapens the gotcha moment. So the unrealistic setup of this ethical quandary, I think cheapens it in that direction. So I'll end with that. All right. Thank you for that, Pat. Thank you, Robert, as well. Uh, I want to thank Robert for not only his contributions to this episode, but for bringing up this uh, concept of talking about Star Trek The Next Generation uh, for his birthday episode. And I have a newfound appreciation. I have not seen any episodes of this show for at least 20 plus years. And having watched now three episodes in the past week, because I thought we might be, might ta- discuss all three, um, I, I'm kind of into it now. And in fact, my daughter, who is almost six, she decided that uh, she was going to not go to bed the other night. And she ended up watching uh, the Offspring episode with us. 
And the next day she said she really liked the Star Trek show. Or she called it the Star Trek movie. And she wants to watch more of it. So we have now, we have a burgeoning new fan of Star Trek The Next Generation. And uh, there's also going to be a new series with Jean-Luc Picard called Picard coming out this fall, I believe. And it's Patrick Stewart as an 85-year-old man and uh, goes through uh, his retired years, I guess, after he leaves as an admiral out of the out of Starfleet or the, what are they called? The Federation? Yeah. It, it looks interesting. I, I saw the promo video for it the other day and it's uh, looks kind of appealing. But this particular episode was quite good and I, I love the philosophical and ethical quandaries that are brought up. And it seems to me like we could probably do an entire show. And I don't mean like an episode. I mean like a new show uh, about just going through the Star Trek uh, universe. Um, and it would be really fun. I don't know if we have the kind of time to devote to that. Probably not. But we should at least throw in, sprinkle in a few episodes here and there of Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Gener- Generation um, because it, it does kind of present fun, fun discussions. So this particular one, I'm going to go with a nine. I really enjoyed this episode and uh, it was uh, it brought me back to my youth. And so extra bonus points for that. Yeah, based on the strength of this episode and how much fun it was to dissect and talk about, and I, having watched the one other one that I've seen, the the Measure of a Man, I tend to agree with you, Daniel. I think we can have this as a repeating thing where we do a Star Trek episode in amongst movies, or even do like you said another show. But it'd be yeah tough to do with time considerations. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of meat in the Next Generation and in the Star Trek too. Those are still some really well written sh- episodes. I don't know so much about... I, I tuned out after Next Generation, so there's what? Voyager, SG-1, uh, whatever else. Yeah, DS9, all that crap. I don't know as much about that stuff, but I know that the original series and Next Generation are some quality stuff, and based on the strength of this episode, yeah, but I'm all I'm all in. And hopefully Pat can come back and do some more, because I know the next episode has an actual court scene in it, which would be fun to get past take on that. Yeah, so maybe uh, maybe we do that in about a month, you know, try to space it out a little bit, pun intended, and uh, Pat, we'd love to have you back. Hell yeah, I always enjoy it, guys. But okay. I don't know if you can handle my analysis of the chord scene. It, it, would, get too, <laughs> it would get too nuanced like uh, My Cousin Vinny, the extended cut. <laughs> I, I bet you we'd still have a, a lot of fun. Oh yeah, they vary from procedure, I'll just say that. I'd, I would object like 50 million times. All right. <laughs> All right, well, Next week, Robert, I think we're yeah. going to have the host of Cannabis Heals Me mm. on to do an episode with us. Uh, she's done her show, I think, uh, for about a year now. And I'd like to think I, I, I played a small part in helping her along, at least in some of the technical aspects. But uh, she's been uh, listening to us for a while. And we finally have something coming together to have her on to do a show. And I think it's going to be Harold and Kumar go to white castle really not guantanamo bay huh well we could we can pepper in the entire the entire nph saga into the uh, discussion but yeah harold and kumar go to white castle next week with uh, cannabis heals me wow okay look forward to that one tune in everybody thanks for sticking with us yes this has uh, been an extra long episode and uh, we thank you guys so much give us uh, your likes and subscribe likes and subscribes that's the word uh, give us reviews on the old iTunes. Uh, visit our guest's website at libertyweekly.net and uh, check out our Patreon at lessonarrives.com slash Patreon and the launchpadmedia.com where we're always launching new ideas in your direction. And with that, we'll say goodnight from last night, everyone.